I'm Nathan Simmons, and I'm going to pee on your bed if you don't let me in. <laughs> and uh, I don't need to be summoning shit. <laughs> and I bet you didn't know your daddy could fly. <laughs> and this is the Silver Linings Playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's bleakest racial violence. <laughs> yeah. I, I got to say... That dad was very misleading because he didn't fly. He was falling with style. If That's anything. so true. <laughs> so true, bestie. <laughs> that, that dad was a fucking liar. We're starting things off heavy, mm-hmm. aren't we? <laughs> well, we have to because uh, it is sadly the final week of spooky linings here on the show. Ugh. We're closing up shop uh, with uh, Mally's choice here. And I'm, I'm hesitant to even say the name of the movie mm. because as I said in my intro, I don't want to be summoning shit right now, guys. Does it count if you say man candy? <laughs> I thought that one might get Nathan. Well, look, Man Candy sounds like a sponsorship on a, on podcasts that I don't listen to. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say in my notes, I wrote down, what if you just say it with a funny accent? Like, what if I say Condi Mod? Does that still count? Or <laughs> <Can't imagine. laughs> uh, Yeah, that. Yes. Oh, shit. That absolutely still counts. What if I say cardamom? <laughs> mm. what, if, what if I say sweet treats, man? Oh. Does that count? Because uh, I think. I, th- I think the rules in this movie don't uh, make a whole lot of sense. Really? Interesting. Because I think there are characters, they say the name of uh, the villain of this movie, uh, and it counts towards someone else saying it. There is one, yeah, there is one moment in this movie where I'm like, okay, you, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and unfortunately, it happens at it, during my favorite scene of the film. <laughs> oh, boy. I have a feeling that scene may be my least favorite, okay. uh, but we'll talk about it when we get there. All right. So, uh, yeah, if you're new to the show, as uh, Mally so eloquently put it there in the intro, we we are a show that likes to watch movies. I'm Mally. He's Mally. <laughs> <laughs> that, that likes to watch movies such as the movie we're talking about today. And uh, we try to find the silver lining at the ending because uh, this movie, it, it kind of just ends. It sure does. Really, like pretty abruptly. It's a little rock and roll, though. <laughs> it is. But I got problems with it. Can I say, I know that we, uh, not to jump to the end completely, but when I saw this movie in the theater... Uh, the title card pops up and I went, woo! <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was fucking jazzed. See, I, I saw the ending and I went, all right. And I no, I remember, I, re- I remember you texting me and Mally and being like, I think Candyman's pretty underwhelming and Mally immediately going like, well, you're the literally the only person that said that to me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I at the time, I had not seen any of the other Candyman movies. Oh, well, yeah. Well, you... I have since. No fucking shit. I have since. I've seen all of them. Okay. That original one rips. Yeah. So... I don't know that it's your fault that yet again, we get a Lego sequel with the same title as the original movie. Like, yep. My my girlfriend was like, yeah, I'm going to watch Candyman with you. And I was like, well, you can't. You have to watch the first one. She's like, "But well, there's no number in this title. Like, why do they keep doing this to me? Mm-hmm. Why is the thing a prequel to the thing? She, she should know better by now. Right? I, I feel like this movie should have been called Candyman mm. because there is, uh, as we find out, more than one. Yeah. And that would have been very helpful to differentiate the two. I like that. I don't like that name. <laughs> what about Candyman S dollar sign? Guys, I, I got to I gotta. Say say right away we are getting way too frivolous with saying his name this many times right i'm not a fan i haven't said <laughs> so, shit yeah I, I i think i've maybe said it once and Nathan, you're getting a little carried away over there so please be careful well, now i'm also getting nervous because my imac has a very reflective uh, screen mm-hmm, exactly <laughs> wait let's just establish this up front mm. so i fucking love this movie mm-hmm. dc has a stupid opinion <laughs> And Nathan, you're in the middle? Man, no, here's the thing. I also love this movie. Boom! Two on one. Go fuck yourself, Dustin. (laughs) I I think it does have problems in terms of the rules, but in terms of fucking sheer vibes, man. And also, there, there are truly, I think, some transcendent moments in this movie, but... Mally, you said you had a hot take on this one. Oh. Do you want to bust that out up top? Well, this isn't my hot take, but I do just want to get this out. Uh-huh. As much as I like this movie, I will say that I was a little mad when it was announced. Sure. Mm-hmm. Because I was actually, I was working on my own uh, Candyman spinoff. Oh, oh boy. Okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, it was a bit of a white, tr- it was a white trash take. Uh-huh. Um, beef jerky dude. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, 
about a guy who dies in a tragic moonshine accident and haunts the woods behind his sister wife's old shed. I knew it. I knew, I knew this was coming. <laughs> it just, you know, well, I mean, you read the first few pages of my script. Uh-huh. You loved it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, yeah, that it did squash my dreams a little bit, but the movie was so good, I didn't care. <laughs> you, you kept saying this is a story that needs to be told. Mm-hmm. This is the perfect time to tell this story right now. Sure. <laughs> now, my hot take, uh-huh. and it, I think it's because I just, I rewatched pretty much these two movies back to back. Yeah. This movie does what Halloween ends tried to do. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. I can kind of see that. Yeah. Because, I mean, the main candy man. Oh, boy. Fuck. <laughs> do we need to put a counter on this episode? Say, can you say candy man? <laughs> From all the other movies, literally, like, like Tony Todd has, has a camp. He has a he has a cameo in this film. Right. I don't know if I would even call it a cameo. He just he's a featured extra. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and you know the movie doesn't fucking focus on him at all. Mm-hmm. Halloween Ends also doesn't fucking focus on Michael Myers. That's yeah, fair. that's true. Yeah, and uh, the protagonist of this movie, much like Halloween Ends, ends up becoming, I guess, sort of the villain. Did you did you want to see Yaya and Tony Todd on a motorcycle together? Oh my god, I'd give anything. Oh, I've never wanted anything more. <laughs> Riding a motorcycle in Chicago, though, mm. absolutely the fuck not. <laughs> I have a lot of, most of my notes are about Chicago, yeah, because I lived there, mm-hmm. and I got notes. I used to live a few blocks from where this movie takes place. Oh, really? Yeah. I just want to clear the air right away. I don't dislike this movie. Sure. I just don't love it. I am perfectly square in the middle. And you're entitled to your incorrect opinion. <laughs> I agree that the movie looks great. I agree that it it has some killer vibes and some great ideas. Mm. I just think it's kind of a muddled mess. And I think it doesn't want to nail down on one specific idea. It wants to just... And I think that's the result of having multiple screenwriters on this movie. That's what I was going to say. I think this movie... Ha- yeah, there's multiple screenwriters. I also... Depending on you know who you're reading an interview with, there may have been like an entirely different uh, a, a couple of subplots that are cut out of this film. Mm-hmm. You know, Helen Lyle was apparently originally supposed to actually appear in the movie. Yep, yep. So I yeah, which you can see in the in the trailer. Yep. But yeah, I I do think that there are some some muddled ideas. But for me. Like, well, one thing, 91 minutes, love that runtime. Oh, that's great. But I also think it could have benefited from a longer runtime. Sure. <laughs> that's, they, it's because it's a bit of a slow burn movie, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And the fact, like, how do you do that in 90 minutes? That's amazing. Right. Uh, the way you do that is you plan. Shut the fuck up, <laughs> Dustin. Nathan and I are talking. Nathan, continue, sir. I, I, I did on this rewatch find some th- stuff that I found to be unnecessary, which is kind yep. of funny in a 91 minute runtime. Yep. But I've also, I've always found it kind of interesting that like there are no, there's no racial elements in the original Clive Barker story. Right. And so like when, you know, Bernard Rose is making the original Candyman movie, it's always been kind of fascinating to me that a white filmmaker decided to make a movie that's nominally about black pain yep. as seen through the point of view of a white character who is being hunted by a black bogeyman. Right. So it's like... You're, you're almost making the points and then not quite. But I also think that the movie makes really interesting points and presents Helen as a character who doesn't realize that she's positioning herself as a white savior and meddling yep. in people's realities. And I think when this movie takes the time to really reckon with how we sort of uh, erase stories mm-hmm. to make them more palatable, I think that's so fascinating. And I, I wish there was a little bit more of that in here. Yep. As it stands, I still think it is a lean, mean movie. No, I, I completely agree with all those points. I think that's my big problem with this movie is I think it's too many ideas sure. and nothing really solidified in like what is the overall message of this movie. And I also think, unfortunately, I think some of the ideas the movie puts forward, it then counteracts and contradicts later on. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Which we can talk about when we get there. But, but I, I agree with your point, too, about the original being like it had everything pitted against it in that original one. Right. Like you said a white filmmaker making a movie about black pain. It skirts the line very well and manages to actually be about something. Right. And um, I do like how this movie, like you said, takes the idea of Helen and kind of makes her the villain right. of that first movie, which, of course, she would be based on, you know, how that community interacted with her and how, like the message of the movie, which is that stories change and they need to be told and history needs to be preserved and things like that. Right. But- much in the same way that Daniel Robitaille was, you know, basically crucified. Right. And came back to get revenge, and now, and after all of these years, it's just like, well, he was a monster. Like, yeah. well, no, that's not exactly how it went down. That's a huge problem with this movie, too. Is yes. 
how they try to some characters use him like a Batman, basically, like sure. come to defend me from these these terrible people. And yeah. other times he's just slaughtering people that have no real recourse for anything. Like, it's- yeah, I do think what's fascinating, though, is that this is a movie that was shot pre pandemic mm-hmm. and comes out post George Floyd protests. Right. Yep. And so it is inextricably tied to that time in history. Very much so. And I think there are so many, there's, there were, when I left this seeing it the first time, I just was like, I had all this righteous anger and the, the Batman, Batmanification of Candyman yeah. really didn't bother me because I, I had a real Lucille Bluth good for her moment. In the movie theater. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do like, Again, there's parts of this movie I think work great. I just sure. don't think as a whole they all connect. I don't think the dots connect very well. Where it gets muddled for me is with Coleman Domingo's character yep. and some of his motivation. But we'll yeah, we'll get there for sure. And to piggyback off your point about the you know the, 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 what was happening when this movie came out, especially with all the protesting and everything going on, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll direct you to the tagline on the poster for this movie, which is "Say His Name." Yes. Oh, so smart. Huge incredibly impactful tells you that this movie has something to say agree like before you even sit in the theater yeah i i think it was perfectly timed due to for you know unfortunate circumstances yes i just i think there's too many cooks in the kitchen that really muddle the script and we'll talk about when we get there but i do want to say on this Mm rewatch this is the second time i've seen the movie and I'm watching this movie for the second time right after getting laid off from my job. Ugh. And so I am watching Anthony in this movie, this character that is unemployed, basically. And he's coming right out of grad school and getting this art gallery exhibition and is trying to discover himself sure. and like what his purpose is in, in this medium. And I'm just resonating so much with him trying to find his place. Wait, is this is this how you tell us that you started painting? I did. I started painting. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> it's not going well. I can't paint for shit. I'm going to be honest. Neither can Anthony. <laughs> I, thank you. I am so glad I was not the first one to say it. We will talk about it when we get there. But there are some moments in this movie where I'm like, I know I'm not supposed to side with the art critic here, uh-huh. but I so do. <laughs> so. Dude, well, that's the thing. Even like my wife, who is my wife. basically, God damn it. <laughs> like who is an, like, like she works for a fucking art magazine. Mm-hmm. Even she was like, his painting only gets good when he's possessed. Yep. I'm like, yeah. And I think that's one of the, I love that point of like, people are constantly more concerned or interested in quote unquote, the narrative than the art itself. Yep. Yep. And that's not, that's not just to him. I mean, uh, Brianna is dealing with this throughout the movie too, which I, I think is such a interesting point. I wanted more of Brianna's story so much. Tiana Paris is unbelievable in this movie. I think she's so good. I think everybody is for the most part. I agree. For the most part dude she she's uh, her and uh the director are the reason i'm kind of hoping the marvels is good i know (laughs) yeah i don't think it'll be good but i i hear you (laughs) i I know i know dc doesn't agree but the fact that she made this movie in 90 minutes and marvels has a kind of short Uh runtime gives me a little hope yeah (sighs) i'm trying to be optimistic here guys i'm not gonna see marvels but i do i do wish the best for them like for real (laughs) i think nia da costa is a visionary with this movie alone i do too i was bummed out because she just had that interview where she was like well you know when you do one of these you know you're just work for hire yeah (laughs) she's like she essentially was like, this isn't like a Nia DaCosta film. This is a Kevin Feige film. No, it's going to look like everything else we turn out. Yeah. That being said, I, I, you know, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. I would love to be proven wrong. I I won't be, but I would love to be. <laughs> can, can we all at least just agree right up top that Yaya is a fucking national treasure? Just, Good Lord. Yeah. The man is is chiseled from marble. Uh-huh. Like I don't know how he looks this good and everything he does. Or like the marbles, am I right? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Good night, everybody. <laughs> I didn't deserve that. <laughs> and Coleman Domingo. Oh my god. Who is without question one of the best working act like character actors we have right now. Yes. Yeah. He's so good. Excited to see him lead uh this movie Rustin that's coming out. Yeah. I'm very excited to see him actually lead a movie. So and fucking Vanessa Williams in the brief little bit she's in this movie mm-hmm. crushes it. Wanted more of her too. Uh but yeah let's let's talk about the the production and the release and all that good stuff surrounding uh this remake slash sequel <laughs> slash reboot, whatever you want to call it to uh what's it called uh, man candy there you go thank you 
Man Candy sounds like a Playboy spinoff, like a Playgirl. Well, we could also <laughs> call it su- like Sweet Dude. <laughs> sweet like, Dude, I'm into like that. Sweet Dude. That it sounds like a brand of like chew you'd get at the <laughs> gas station. Isn't that the tattoos that uh, Ashton Kutcher and Sean William Scott get in that movie? <laughs> sweet Dude. dude sweet Dude. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that movie. Whatever that shit was. Yeah, that movie. <laughs> you were close. That movie that shall not be named just like this one. <laughs> So the year is 2021. The director is, as we mentioned, is Nia DaCosta. Uh, the film stars Yahya Abdul Mateen II. Good job. I yeah. know. Thank you. Tiona Paris, Tony Todd, Nathan Stewart, Jared, Coleman Domingo, and Vanessa Williams. Uh, the movie had a budget of $22 million, managed to gross $77 million worldwide. So a pretty big hit. Not bad coming out of, you know, when people were still not sure about going to the movies again. Absolutely. This was, I think, one of the first movies I saw back in theaters after, uh, well, yeah. dur- during pandemic, I should say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the film currently sits at a well-deserved 84% on Rotten Tomatoes. Nice. I think 84% is pretty apt. Yeah. How I feel about this movie. Okay. So, anything else before we get into the trailer? You you said you watched... So, you've seen Candyman 2 and 3 also. Yes, I have. They are hot garbage. Hot. And I'm so glad they're never referenced in this movie. <laughs> yeah. Hot garbage. Well, it's like... I mean, this and the original are the only good ones. Yes. Yep. I agree. Like, let's just let's just be real here. Absolutely. That first one, I was entranced by how good it was. Like, yeah. I knew it was going to be at least watchable and serviceable for the time period, uh-huh. but it was truly, like... I don't know, man. It, it has uh, an aura to it and a, a, a hypnotizing kind of gothic feel to it that I really fucked with. Yeah. And it was horny. It's it was so a horny, horny horror movie. <laughs> the, I mean, the first line of dialogue is the narration where Tony Todd says, I came. Yes. That's the, <laughs> how the so, movie begins. It's so good. It's so good. I. It's great. It's the first movie, I think, that I remember giving me nightmares as a kid. Mm, really? Like, I distinctly remember having a dream about out that that shot where Candyman flies backwards out the window. Oh yeah, which is such a where the fuck did that come from moment? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember that and the scene with the the kid in screaming in the bathrooms yep. where you don't really see what happened. Like that. Oh man, that like really got under my skin. Yeah, it still holds up. Like it's still a really good movie. So all right, fellas, let's let's recap. Let's rewatch this trailer and see how we feel about it. Mm-hmm. If, you say if a movie like takes place in Chicago, it doesn't matter where they live, they have to walk across those bridges. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who would do that? That one girl kind of looked like oh. Dustin. <laughs> Trina, you broke the door. This isn't funny! I do remember seeing this first trailer thinking, this isn't the movie that I want. Nope. (laughs) Like that opening bit. No, that's that's my least favorite scene of the entire movie. Yeah. It's a third of this trailer, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. That one scene. I'm an artist. You look up a candy man. The monster. This is another movie where I'm just like, go to the fucking hospital. Yep. (laughs) Oh, every other note is, bro, go to urgent care. Yep. Yep. Most of my notes. Like, did Nia DaCosta ever apologize to people with trypophobia? (laughs) (laughs) Candyman. 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 Don't. Don't say that. I love that moment. It's a great moment. Oh, God, she's great. It's a great moment. That character has some of the wildest lines of dialogue I've ever heard in my fucking life. I hate it. I hate his character so much. Some of the worst dialogue. I hate his character so much. I forgot they used that in this trailer. Yeah. (laughs) Isn't that wild? Destiny's Child song. That's so good. We're living in a post-us world. Yeah. (laughs) He's the slowed down R&B song. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. I don't hate it. Uh, I don't want to be that guy, but I'm pretty sure one of the Fifty Shades movies did that before. Yeah. Us. Yeah. I think you're right. Oh yeah, there was the shot of Helen. We are seeing nearly every kill in the movie. Yep. Be my victim. This is not real. It's not real. Candyman. Ah, uh, it's 
a great trailer, man. I just got chills. Yeah. <laughs> it shows a lot. It yeah. does show a lot. All right. So I, I guess I want to talk real quick about the note that I had that was <laughs> the longest okay. because it's it's no secret <laughs> that we are three white guys reviewing <laughs> this movie about black pain. Sure. And I will say that we're probably not going to have the best takes or the insight of a life lived. Yeah. I mean, you certainly fucking aren't. <laughs> I feel like being as vulnerable as I can be, Mm -hmm. I do have to say that I think this movie puts me as a white guy who enjoys art in a very particular and interesting bind Mm. based on the one hand that the character of Anthony, who is this artist, I want to appreciate his endeavors and appreciate the work he's doing, especially with how it relates to the real world and artists like him, Mm -hmm. like using their their culture and their history to express themselves especially in a modern world where we're still dealing with that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. and simultaneously on the other hand i have to grapple with the fact that i kind of agree with the art critic to an extent when Mm -hmm. she says especially when she reviews his first piece and she says how it's about the ambient violence of the gentrification cycle right something that he is actively a part of in his giant apartment and his nice clothes yeah Yeah. that apartment's so fucking expensive oh my god (laughs) yes and when when she says, you know, you people move into these, blah, 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 blah. And he goes, what do you mean you people? And she says, artists. Mm. And I'm like, she tears him apart she in that scene. It's, it's not that those things aren't important and that we shouldn't reflect on them and truly identify with the history mm-hmm. and the reasoning behind them. But there's also a point where it's like, I understand where you're coming from, but you're also the 400th person to make an art installation like this. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, and it's, it's also tempered, though, by there are so many racial micro aggressions in the dialogue yep. in that scene yep. you you have her your pe- your people comment yep. you have uh troy the art critic says something like not troy sorry uh clive yeah yeah he he says he calls him the great black hope of the art scene yep. and like starts speaking for him yep. there's a bit where he 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 very pointedly says to brianna go get your, your boy. boy oh <laughs> yeah which is insane it's it's rough yeah and it's not it's not ri- it's not delivered as like i am making a you know uh, a microaggression at this point yep. but it's it's not a mistake in the terminology that's used no that's a specific word yeah. that the writer chose for sure absolutely and at some point you know looking at like the artwork he's making like when when brianna says there's no room for interpretation it's just literal yeah i'm thinking that at some point any originality that could be have been instilled into what anthony's artwork is about is gone and mm-hmm. it becomes diluted by the oversaturation of other artists work do- about the exact same thing right and it's a tough position to hold because you obviously don't want to come off as being racist or uncaring uh or even like like you're negating the importance of the topic but mm-hmm. also i'm sitting here thinking how many times can i see a black artist talk about racial inequality or police brutality before i kind of become desensitized to the art aspect of it you know what i mean well like, and and i think that's i don't think that's a mistake either because so much of this movie is about the cycle of violence Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're still having the same conversations uh, that we were having in 1992 and and way back before that. I mean, we're we're still dealing with the same shit. So, yeah, it and people do become desensitized to it. Just like, you know, when when you hear that there is a Black Lives Matter protest, you think, fuck, well, like, what did what is the what have the police done now? It's not like it's it's a matter of statistics uh, at, at some point. And that that's infuriating on its own. And again, not to diminish any of this stuff, but. But when I think it's I think it's Clive that says this, but when he says, you know, I want um, you know, I, I see that's the same old art that you've been doing. I want the new stuff. Uh-huh. And then he but then he also says out of his out of the other side of his mouth to <laughs> use his story. And Anthony's like, Well, I don't really have a story. And then he says, Well, the South Side's played out. So yes. like make up a different story. Yeah, like he doesn't I, actually care about the the, the story. Right. He just wants to be able to sell it. And and then one of the most heartbreaking scenes for me is when Brianna meets with the art curator that she values her opinion so highly of. Right. And she says, Oh, well, use your story about your father's legacy. And it's like it's all black pain and i'm like i would love to see anthony make something that's not about black pain because not to diminish his experiences but i that's that's what a lot of black artists have become known for unfortunately because that's the ones that rise above you know the the rest of them Mm -hmm. so uh, that's it puts me in a rough situation i as a viewer sure but i I think that's another thing that i appreciate about the filmmaking and this movie is it's it's one thing to show us the 
you know, the, the, the shadow puppet version of Daniel Robitaille's story. Right. It's something else entirely to, in Candyman 2, show us a long protracted oh scene of yeah. a black man being lynched and murdered. Yeah. Uh, you know, which is, you know, uh, we, yeah, we don't, we don't need to do that. No, we don't. To, to tell this story. And, and then you have like some of the clunkiest dialogue. <laughs> sure. Is with Brianna at the beginning when she says, white people built the ghetto, then erased it when they realized they built the ghetto. And I'm like, that's true. But also, that is the most direct, as you point out later, that is, there, it leaves no room for interpretation about what this movie is. Right. Like, it just feels like they're trying to grapple too much stuff and kind of treats the audience like me as stupid for not knowing this stuff. But <laughs> well, a lot of art lately has been about this kind of thing. You know what I mean? You know, I agree. I actually think the movie would benefit a little bit more from some, uh, a little bit more ambiguity. And I think you're right. This is like a, the, a script polish situation. Yeah. It's a oh, well, we cut a scene to get down to 91 minutes, so can we just have a character say this theme out loud? I I think you just cut that line right away and that already improves things significantly like mm. I, I don't need you to lay out the story for me i understand because well, it's relitigated later yeah uh, you know in in his own conversation yeah i think you guys are focusing on the wrong thing in this movie completely oh <laughs> okay where are we going with this who the fuck <laughs> is named jerica <laughs> <laughs> people that love joy division apparently <laughs> yeah. it's uh it's the well uh, it's the true name of jim from jim and the holograms so. oh, mm, that's very true oh yeah. sick reference thanks okay. man <laughs> Okay, I I don't want to get too into the weeds about this. I was like, this is either going to get me praised or made fun of. I'm going to go for it. <laughs> a little bit of both. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. But no, seriously, that's my biggest issue with this movie. Uh huh. Jerica. 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 Well, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna talk about the naming of characters, the fact that they, you named the scummiest character in this movie, Clive. Clive. No, that tracks. It's so it's so upsetting. That that's the that's the Cliveiest Clive to have ever Clived. <laughs> That is so upsetting. That is so upsetting that they named that guy after Clive Barker. But it's not a Barker Clive, though. Yeah, I, I don't want to get too into the weeds about this stuff because I'm not qualified to speak on any of it. But sure. it's just it was interesting on this rewatch of like, I fully agree with the sentiments that this movie's trying to put across, but it's also trying to tackle so many different things yeah. like gentrification and then police brutality and racial inequality. And it's like, I wish you would have just picked one theme and really honed in on it. Instead, you've got too many hands in the cookie jar trying to tell their own story. And that's because there's three different screenwriters. You know what I mean? Oh, I want some cookies. <laughs> Did you ever get the feeling <laughs> he wants cookies so bad? Did you ever get the feeling that this was meant to be maybe more than one film? Yeah. And they said, fuck it, we're going to go for all you know all killer no filler i, I sure do i think they were like eh, maybe we do a trilogy or something yeah. that halloween 2018 was pretty successful now they're getting sequels you know right i definitely see that um I, again i don't hate this movie i'm just it's i want it to be better than it is which is unfortunate i get what you're saying yeah i mean it does feel at some points you know i i love the moment when the as much as i dislike the art critic character yeah when she tells him or when you know when when they point out he's like literally standing next to her explaining the whole bit and right. it's like well that you, you your art isn't speaking for itself and yeah. there are moments in this movie where i i think you know maybe i needed this a little less spelled out for me and then there's others where i just need I need, I need Coleman Domingo to look me in the eye and say, this is my plan. <laughs> Thank you. I have no idea what his fucking plan is. Well, so I, get, I, I get it from, I get it if you remove the bit about his sister being killed. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> if, his ki- if his sister is killed, then I don't understand the idea of, God, we need a candy man. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't think he liked his sister. <laughs> he, he, he did sure say did. he was going to pee on her bed. That's a, that's a war cry. <laughs> It's against the Geneva Convention. I don't know who Geneva is, but yeah. (laughs) There's so many threads in this movie that are started and never followed up on. Just Mm -hmm. like Brianna's dad killing himself or Coleman Domingo's character having problems with his sister. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you haven't seen the movie, we can briefly explain sort of the, I don't even want to say the plot, but like the themes of the movie, which Mm -hmm. is the titular character whose name I dare not speak. Sweet dude. (laughs) Sweet pea. Sweet pea. <laughs> it's not just one person. He is an amalgamation of different stories through the time of mm-hmm. black men that have been murdered or abused that then go on to become this sort of urban legend. And the one we're all familiar with, Daniel Robitaille, is just one of many. Yeah. And so this movie starts and there is a, a sweet dude that is not Tony Todd. Mm-hmm. That is not Daniel Robitaille. It's this, this man Sherman. 
And his story is basically that he worked at a candy factory. He mm-hmm. seemed to be a little slow, putting it lightly. And our our main one of the main characters in the movie, Coleman Domingo's character, William Burke, runs into him uh, in uh, Cabrini Green back in the 70s mm-hmm. when he was doing laundry. Sherman steps out of a hole in the wall. And he's apparently been wanted by the police because the, earlier uh, in the year, a white girl found razor blades in her candy. And they immediately blamed him. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, it spooks William Burke and he screams, the police rush in and they beat Sherman to death. Mm -hmm. And so one of the best parts of this movie, I will say, to say things I like is when, and we're jumping all around here, but when Anthony goes Mm -hmm. to see him and he asks, who is Candyman? Mm -hmm. William Burke says, well, to me, it was Sherman, whatever his last name. And I was like, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Because that exemplifies the whole purpose of the movie. I mm-hmm. love that. In that there is no one singular incident. It's an, it's all stories that get passed down and that goes perfectly un- in contrast with what Troy says earlier about when he's telling uh, the story of the first movie where Helen is the vi- is the villain mm-hmm. and she stole baby Anthony and things change, details change, which is why the characters exist in the first place. Right. Like her, you know, the idea of, you know, in the original movie they find her in a room full of blood and she's like slipping and sliding because mm-hmm. it's so disgusting. Yeah. And now over time that has morphed into she was making snow angels in the blood. Yes. And, yes. Uh, you know, there's, yeah, I, I, I love that detail. I also love that this intro that is the reverse shot uh, of the intro from the first film uh, of, of the buildings. Not only that, but the reverse shots of the of the production cards. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All the, the Universal logos backwards, the Monkey Paw logos backwards, the Braun one. It's 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 brilliant. Uh, it's great. No, the, 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 the Worms Eye View of foggy chicago is brilliant mm-hmm. it's incredible did you say the worm's eye view? yeah there's the bird's eye view looking down from the original and this is the worm's eye view looking up yeah whatever you went to film school the same place i went to that's what it's called i think they stopped teaching that one by the time i <laughs> got there that's what it's called it's it's the opposite of a bird's eye it's a worm's eye mm. so there you go i rolled with it i was like i've never heard that before but i like it i fucking guess the 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 puppetry in this movie the shadow puppetry is incredible yeah oh, it's fantastic not only a great artistic choice and it's very creepy but also to get your exposition across that way without having to literally show scenes from the first movie yeah. i love a creepy puppet show it's great it's fantastic and it also the first instance we get of it with the uh, little william burke here playing with it and the first thing you see is a police officer chasing what's presumably a black man it's incredible yes that's the stuff i want i want that kind of subtlety and i love the subtlety of of like l- little William is like taking his little Willie, if you will, oh, uh, is taking his his laundry, and he's walking past police officers yep. who they're posted up everywhere, but they're not interested in making them feel safe. Nope. You know, there's a there's the bit where he even drops a sock, and these two cops just kind of like stare at him, yep. like like he's a zoo animal when he's you know picking it up and walking past them. Like Absolutely. there's no there's no feeling of protection here. There's some great instances with stuff like that like later on when anthony is going to the old cabrini green area uh-huh. and he's just walking through he hears a police siren and he instinctively kind of like hides yeah that stuff like that is great that's the kind of deafness i want in the screenplay <laughs> when coleman domingo calls the police later he's clearly doing a voice yeah, like oh, he's absolutely. he's trying not to sound black you know yeah. it's yeah it's really it's a fast it's a fantastic choice absolutely I think the the score is really great in this movie too. I love this kind of like off key little keyboard that oh, comes yeah. in during these credits by Robert Aiki, Aubrey Lowe. I I think it's so haunting and like so unsettling right away, and it it fits. Like I said, I think a lot of this movie works. Sure. I think the parts that don't for me is just the story, yeah, just the writing, just the dialogue and the plot. Like everything else is solid. So. 84% is is pretty accurate. And the it's, score, like you said, feels like a, a modern evolution of the Philip Glass score from the original film, yes. too. Like, it still feels of a piece. Yeah, yeah, very much so. No, absolutely. I just, I think that, you know, they say don't take candy from strangers, mm. but especially don't take candy from strangers if they step out of a hole in a wall <laughs> and offers it to you, and they have a hook hand. And I think, brandish a hook towards you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, I don't think, get that candy. Okay, so William Berg. Get I have, that candy I, out of my face. <laughs> I have questions about this character. Uh-huh. So, what we see in the movie is he's in, he's in what you know, quote unquote, the projects. He is he has to leave his home. At, he's probably like what, like maybe ten, eleven, right? Yeah. Uh, when we first see him, something like that. Yeah. He has to leave, walk so far away just to do laundry in this in this 
group facility. Mm -hmm. He sees Sherman. He freaks out. The police rush in. And because he freaked out and the police caught Sherman, they beat him to death. Later on, his sister and his sister's friend are trying to summon uh, (laughs) Sweet Dude. And (laughs) they won't let him join. And when they do it, Sherman appears and kills the sister and the friend. Mm -hmm. And this is where I get confused because then, as we're told by, by Coleman Domingo later on in the movie, when he is just unhinged entirely in the third act, he wanted to make his own Candyman, which is what he uses Anthony for. Right. And then that's where I just have question mark, question mark, question mark. I don't understand to what end. Uh, the, the implication seems to be that Daniel had taken Anthony to use him as a, like, the ultimate sacrifice. If I kill a baby in the middle of town, right. or, you know, in the middle of the projects, everyone's going to remember my, you know, my legend forever. Mm-hmm. And Helen's able to stop him. Um, but in, in doing so, she becomes a legend and essentially, much like white people erased the projects, she erases Candyman. Right. And she inadvertently is a white savior. Right, yeah. exactly. And and what I f- what I think William's plan is mm-hmm. is he wants he wants to create a Candyman that's no longer just a symbol of pain and more of like a vengeful you know, a vengeful god right. to, to like protect him and his family. But yeah, he goes about it in a very puzzling way. And again, I don't know that seeing my family murdered by Candyman would make me say, I need one of these. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, well, it depends on which members of my family it was. <laughs> sure. I I think that's where the muddledness comes in from because yeah. if that's the plan, then the way they treat the character of <laughs> Sweet Dude, <laughs> they they change the rules and what the character stands for throughout the movie because like i said at times it's just oh these white girls in this bathroom summon him and he kills them all just for just for summoning him sure and then later on brianna uses him to murder a bunch of police officers so it's like and not her you could almost see billy's plan you know william's plan being emblematic uh, uh, sort of a a metafictional take on what nia da costa set out to do with the character which is he's no longer just a boogeyman he's actually this vengeful spirit right but i i i don't know i maybe he's i'm batman he's, ba- <laughs> he's, he's a vigilante <laughs> yeah. well i think they're i think what they're trying to do is and again i think this might just be because i've been watching narcos lately <laughs> okay <laughs> they're they're trying to do like trying to do the thing where like how pablo escobar you know is renowned as like this horrible drug kingpin dude but uh-huh. then you know if you talk to like some older folks in Colombia, like they see him as like a Robin Hood type figure. Sure. He did a lot of good for their communities. And I think that's how they're trying to portray Candyman in this. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> um, like to like to the outside world, like his legend, you know, he's like a fucking murdering ghost, scary person. But So stay away from us. Yeah. But yeah. like to some people in the neighborhood, like Willie, he's like a, you know kills the bad people a protector yeah yeah he's a batman which i i i dig that idea but i i still think that it's it gets a little muddled with the sister stuff i do agree if you take the sister like if you take willie's sister getting killed out Mm -hmm. it tracks so much better yes unless he really didn't like his sister (laughs) because i think the original screenplay was helen influencing willie to do this but i'm i'm not a hundred percent sure on that if that's just hearsay if that's the case then and I remember watching it the first time thinking, because I had forgotten about the sister, is that, oh, the the villain in this movie only kills white folks, which makes sense. Uh-huh. If, that's the th- if the theme of the story is this gentrification cycle and police brutality and racial inequality and all this stuff. Yeah. But then William's experience with it is uh, a, you know, that his sister and her sis- his sister friend died. Uh-huh. And- I get, like I said, I think it's just, it's not clear how they want to use this character. Right. And I think that lends itself to a lot of confusion, a lot of muddleness, and why the movie doesn't work fully to me. It'd be like if in, the, in Nightmare on Elm Street 4, Kristen's <laughs> like, we got to bring Freddy back, right. you guys. <laughs> right. We've got to. Right. Well, and I think an, another thing they're trying to do, like, because I know a lot of people were confused, like, when Brianna says his name at the end, mm-hmm. they're like, well, but he's always killed the people that say his name. Yeah. I think they're trying to imply that, like, it's the intention of saying his name. Mm-hmm. Like, she's the only person that, like, calls him for help. Right. Everyone else in the movie is just like, oh, ha ha, let's, ha ha, let's do this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ha 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 ha. But like, she, she uses him in the way that Willie actually intended him to be used, if that makes sense. See, that would be perfect if that was explained. I like that. 
And it signals that he is a new kind of candy man. Yeah. I think I've said it like 12 times now. Yeah, you guys are dead. You guys are dead. <laughs> so rest in peace. <laughs> I think I'm at two. I'm at two or three. Um, Nathan, I'm sorry. Rest in peace. Uh, <laughs> oh, Nathan's been deaded twice by now. <laughs> Easy. Easy deaded twice. I don't want to live after Spooky Linings is over. Well, to be fair, we don't know what his intent is. Maybe he, he's calling upon him to, to save him versus test him, basically, you know? I guess we'll find out. <laughs> Listen, I'm defending the guy, so... <laughs> Yeah, no, I just it's it's frustrating. I really wish this movie held together better for me because I want to like it so much, mm. and it's just I I don't understand the rules. I don't understand the story they're trying to tell, but I like I did I dig the vibes. Well, and it's it's funny that that like like all the stuff I'm saying like that's what I got from the movie, and it's and it's funny like we, you know all three of us watched the same movie, but we picked up or didn't pick up on different things. Right? Totally. Like I thought I thought her using him as a defensive tool was very clear. No, I agree. I, I I think again, it's a little weird that she lets the other guy finish it, and that still works. That's another problem too. <laughs> I no, I totally agree with that, and I think that this is certainly a movie that uh, rewards repeat viewings, and thankfully, it's short enough that it doesn't feel like a hassle to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, I enjoyed this rewatch. Yeah, I watched this and something else last night. Hell yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, no, I enjoyed this rewatch, and I remember in the first time seeing it, being like, I don't think I got it, <laughs> and then knowing everything that happens in this movie, watching it the second time, being like. Like, no, I understand what's happening. I'm still just, it just doesn't make sense. So, <laughs> I, and I agree, Mally, that that's why she is calling upon him at the end there to, as a protection, basically. But it doesn't make sense in terms of the roles that the movie has put in place mm. and like what the character represents, I, I guess, is my problem. See, but that's the thing. It does. It makes perfect sense to me. Okay. I, I get it. All right. Like that's, I find that, like, I find it fascinating that we have such conflicting opinions on that. Well, I will say in my research, reading a bunch of different threads, about the movie and everything and everyone's interpretation that a lot of people similarly feel like they're that it was just a little bit confusing and muddled but mm. i'm glad it made sense for you i wish it did for me i just i it just and i also think saying his name five times is too many why not three five seems excessive <laughs> why can't we get it down to bloody mary rules <laughs> that's my problem with the movie <laughs> That's my real problem with this movie. Too many times people say it his name. Well, then Nathan would be dead like four times over at this point. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. You'll have to ask Clive Barker about that. All right. So I let, I've talked plenty about the stuff I don't like. I do want to talk about stuff I do like. I think this movie looks incredible. Mm-hmm. The camera work is insanely good. Mm-hmm. Yep. It is visually striking. I, I wish I had a little bit more of that hypnotic feel that the original did. Yeah. And I think it gets there at some times. Like, I think my favorite shot of the movie is... Um, just that long wide shot of Anthony walking across the bridge with the VO over it. Yeah. Oh, the, the Chicago shot. Yeah. The Chicago <laughs> shot. Chicago is not as much of a character in this movie as it was in the original. And I found that unfortunate too. Mm. It's definitely there. Like I do love when Anthony is going around taking pictures before he gets stung by the bee and he comes across the church, which the church is a fascinating story if you're not aware of it. Oh, but yeah. he sees, he has this photograph, this Polaroid of this church that has got this beautiful mural on the outside of it. And then he takes it away from the camera and, and it, the church is just completely, literally painted flat white, literally whitewashed. Yep, which is a real church that that really happened. And as recent as 2015, this happened. Yeah, this church that had this mural on the outside, painted by a black artist in this black neighborhood mm-hmm. that represented all these uh, historical figures, uh, these historical black figures that fought for civil rights and things like that. Mm-hmm. And later, when the church was struggling economically, they had to sell it, and a company literally said, "Well, we can't." So this church with graffiti all over it, we mm-hmm. need it to look better for the neighborhood. We have to paint it and paint it over it. Yeah, I still live there when that happened. It's insane that that happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it it was it was a huge fucking thing when that happened. I imagine so. And and the fact that that plays so perfectly into not only the real world but in the world of this movie, like the whitewashing of history mm-hmm. and like. The themes of this movie are so strong. Yes. It's so strong and so poignant and so timely that, yeah, it's just, it's it's a visually striking movie, too. So, all of this stuff works for me so well. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about Clive and Jerrica, though, because we haven't really <laughs> talked a whole lot about the plot. <laughs> so, one of my favorite moments, it it's not, it's it, it was my wife's reaction to something in the movie. Uh-huh. When Clive gets murdered, uh-huh. he loses a shoe, and I go, and I was like, oh, fuck, he lost a shoe. And my wife, <laughs> <Really>? completely <laughs> straight-faced, looks at me, she's like, well, it was only one, so we can't confirm he's dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, damn. <laughs> wow. Good point. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> this scene, the, the two characters here is maybe some of the funniest parts of the movie. Jesus, Jerrica, we get it. You <laughs> like Joy Division. He also has that moment when Yaya's getting like 
escorted out. Yes. He's like, that's not spontaneous. You had that one in the bank. Yes, yes. So, and, and the follow-up with that with, don't worry, I'm on the Nuva ring. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it got a good laugh out of me. So, the plot of this movie, I guess we haven't really talked about it. So, Anthony is an artist living with his girlfriend, Brianna, in Chicago, mm-hmm. and they hear the story of Helen through Bri- uh, Brianna's brother, Troy. Uh-huh. Anthony gets inspired by it and goes and does research for a new art installation by going and basically uncovering the the plot and the story of the first movie. He paints this this mural. It gets the attention of uh, this art curator, Clive, who he works with. And he puts this installation up at this gallery um, where you have a mirror and you say, sweet dude's real name, five times in the mirror, blah, blah, blah. This art critic comes in and just reams him and says, look, this is just the same shit I've been seeing. Mm-hmm. This is nothing revolutionary. You're kind of just continuing the cycle of gentrification and everything because you are an artist and you want to come in and not have a day job and just dick around and sort of like Helen in the first movie, kind of exploit the history of the location you're in for your own gain. Uh-huh. Yaya takes this and kind of just lashes out. He lashes out at the the art curator, Clive. <sighs> he lashes out at this other guy that, that mocks his original work. I I love god he's like he thinks that it's like found or he he says like we're using like found materials yeah. uh, i think it was so smart to put them in the back where did you find them at a thrift shop yeah, yeah. he says i found them in the studio where i painted them you goofy ass fuck goofy fuck <laughs> <laughs> so calling someone goofy you can't come back from it you goofy ass fuck <laughs> it's so i need i need uh, that shot of yaya saying bitch on bitch. a loop it is so uh it is uh, it's nectar to my ears. <laughs> it's so good. He calls this guy a goofy fuck, and then Clive and Jerrica, the the art curator and like his intern slash girlfriend. Yeah, he says, "And you too, you fucking hyenas." And Clive says something, and then <laughs> Yaya's chirp back is, "Shouldn't you be stocking up on morning after pills to accommodate your summer intern program?" That's so good. <laughs> fucking gets his ass <laughs> to. To which Clive says, yeah, you, that wasn't spontaneous. You had that in the back pocket. He goes, yup, bitch. <laughs> and just walks the fuck out. It's so good. And then that's followed up with my favorite line of the movie, which is Derek is saying, well, I'm, I'm on the Nuva ring. <laughs> and he goes, I know, it's fine. <laughs> and he also says, I can handle being called a bitch. <laughs> but we do get, like, I, I love the life in in him in these early scenes in, in, in Yaya's performance. Yeah. And I think when you're talking about the sort of hypnotic nature of how the first movie was shot, I think instead we get that here in his performance because I can't even when this dude is just staring at a mirror or looking down at his nail his fingernails like I can't take my eyes off of him Mm -hmm. he's such an incredible actor national treasure absolutely he's incredibly engrossing listen y'all say what you will about the new Watchmen series but my man Yaya crushes that oh he's great He's great on it. Even the dog agrees. <laughs> <laughs> I love the new Watchmen series. I and Yaya too. is a great part of that. It's so fucking good, dude. I didn't care for him too much in Matrix uh, Resurrection, but that's not his fault. That's I just because I didn't enjoy is. that movie. <laughs> so we, we stay at the, the art gallery afterwards as, as Clive and Derek are cleaning up. And I can't... It, Clive is just bitching about Anthony. Yeah. Like, oh, he doesn't appreciate what he's got. And she keeps throwing out little nuggets of wisdom. Uh-huh. Love will tear us apart. Jesus, Jericho, we get it. You like Joy Division. <laughs> but it's also, it's super telling that Clive also mentions that he didn't read the press release for Anthony's work. Yep. Like, he's putting stuff on display because of the the narrative that he can sell around it. Right. He doesn't actually care about the substance of the art. That's yep. what Coleman Domingo says later on. Yeah. He's like, they like what you make, but not you. Right. It's It's perfect. It's a great line that that coleman has later and up until this point i think this movie is really great but after the art show i think it starts to go downhill and it starts right here with the jokes about necrophilia (laughs) well that and then just the i don't know if it's the performance i think it's just the dialogue i think it's i think it's partially the performance as well well it's the way he says not unless we Fuck. fuck. <laughs> like, what What are you fucking, William Shatner? What the fuck was that? <laughs> Not, um, less we fuck. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how he says it. <laughs> I also don't enjoy his Jurassic Park reference here. Oh my God. <laughs> we have got to hang up the must go faster joke. We have got must to go faster. What is this? Okay, so she says it five times in the mirror. Uh-huh. She's instantly killed, and his 
reaction to it is just i'm going is this real <laughs> i'm like i don't know dude it looks pretty real you seem pretty nonplussed by the fact that this girl not only got her throat slit in front of you but you're also seeing a ghost slice up these screens with a hook hand and yeah. you are making jurassic park references what the fuck are you doing it, but i also on the on the flip side love the the bit that they are like hooked together yeah. so he's like trying to run away and drags her i do like that i do and then he gets away and he drags him right back to her body Ugh. I'm also just going to say, I don't think this is the first time uh, an intern has died in Clive's presence. Probably Absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> it's it's the strangest way one has died. For sure. I, I think one, one of the big problems, too, I have with this movie is, I, and it's unfortunate, mm. is that I think all of the deaths in this movie kind of seem inconsequential. And oh, interesting. And almost like... It almost feels like the movie has to take a detour just to have them because it suddenly remembers it's a horror movie and needs a body count. You know what I mean? See, I I think it it's part of building the narrative around his artwork. Like I I, I the the only one to me that I feel like is inconsequential the is high school the, girls is the high school sequence. And yes. even that that's a studio note. It absolutely is. You <laughs> could make an argument that it's meant to illustrate the the urban legend spreading, yeah. but I still don't particularly buy that because it's also no, I don't think it's ever referenced again. Nope. No only tie they have there is this girl is there at the beginning of the art gallery scene right. and then you never see her again well i think we would have made it work at least a little better if this is really what you want to do is make that girl the art critic's daughter oh sure and make it where like they they bump into each other and she's like are you having fun here at the art co-? whatever make them have a conversation so that it's not just some random girl right that just happens to be killed later tie things even closer to 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 um anthony yes yeah, that's a big question, too, I have is how is Anthony not a prime suspect in the murder of these two people? Because right. not only did he and the the girl die right in front of Anthony's artwork, but a lot of people saw them having an argument as he left that night. Right. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Well, I mean, like one of the one of the most fascinating things about the original film is how uh, t- uh, over the course of the movie, Daniel sort of erodes Helen's sense of privilege. Yes. Right. Like, yes. Uh, and. And we don't really ever get that. We see Anthony's personal life falling apart. But right. you're right. There's never a moment where, you know, he's feeling the heat from having been, you know, attached to these murders. And that would have tied in so well with the theme of racial profiling that they do at the end of the movie. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. I I, I do like, though, when the next morning they're talking about the murders on TV oh. and they mention his name and his reaction is to go, they said my name on the news. He's so happy about that. <laughs> Cut to the wide shot of. Brie and Troy just their mouths agape looking at us. shocked. <laughs> yeah, so good. It's great. Oh, we we also have to talk about how great the the stuff with reflections is in this movie. Oh even, man, yeah. Even in the in the proceed when Clive is getting killed, you can see Candyman oh, like boy. slightly reflected in the doors to the gallery. Yeah, and it's, it's such a like blink and you'll miss. It. There were m- multiple times on this rewatch that I rewound something because I was like, oh my, like I didn't see it, but my brain did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Where I'm just like, that's like perfect bit of sleight of hand. There's <laughs> there's one bit where Candyman sort of like peeks into the bathroom and the art critic's home. Mm-hmm. And you sort of just see him in the upper corner of the screen. Oh, God, it's so good. There, there's good stuff, too, with Anthony's reflection not lining up yeah. at the very tail end of a shot. Yeah. It's really good. I also want to talk about, we briefly mentioned it, but. Brianna's backstory here. Yeah. I think the choice to have like the sporadic jumps in time in this weird montage right after this, where we find out about Brianna's father killing himself. Uh I feel like it's just another reason why this movie does work for me because it feels like it's, it feels like it's trying to convince me that the movie is creepy and off-putting instead of at times actually being creepy and off-putting. Interesting. It's like, oh, Brianna's dad killed himself. Isn't that creepy? I'm like, it would be if it was tied in more with the story, but yeah, it kind of just seems like a nothing thing. You know what I mean? It just sort of builds onto her own sense of guilt. Yeah. Like, it makes sense later on when the the other art curator is like, oh, use your father's legacy. And I'm like, that would have been great if it was more prevalent in this movie. Like, Brianna's... Because she kind of becomes the main focal point of the movie. Like, after Anthony disappears. Right. The third act is... It's her movie, it's suddenly. Mm-hmm. So... I don't know. I I like the idea of 
Brianna also coming from a troubled past, but it feels like a non sequitur almost. Sure. I, I also, you know, and I get a little distracted because if I'm Brianna and I come in and my my boyfriend is running cold water over the gaping sore in his hand Dude. and saying, hey, why don't we take you to the ER tonight? Yeah. Well, I, and I got to say, between this and I, I watched this movie right after having watched The Fly. Oh, sure. I don't need to see fingernails fucking popping off. Fingernail I don't trauma. Need, I don't need <laughs> yeah. to see anymore. Have you guys ever had a fingernail fucking fall off? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I have. Oh, it's the fucking worst. I've had a toenail come off. I've had a toenail come just, off, too. I just got lightheaded. I can't I can't hear this. I, I can't handle it either. Ugh. I'm over it. I can't, I'm done with fingernail trauma. No, I wrote I wrote down uh, Anthony Goldblum's himself. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> the worst one is in the ring mm. during the tape segment. That is the worst one for me with oh, the yeah. literal nail going through someone's fingernail. Ugh. <sighs> I can't do it. But yeah, go to the fucking hospital, dude. Right. Go to the hospital. <laughs> Didn't we do another movie this season where we were talking about that? Or like, just go to the fucking hospital? Probably. I can't remember now. The whale. Oh, oh that's sure. right. Just go to the fucking hospital. <laughs> well, and also George C. Scott goes to the hospital like 15 times in The Exorcist. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the girls at the end of Bodies, Bodies, Bodies could have benefited from going to the hospital right <laughs> after. So a lot of hospital related incidents in this in this season. Mm-hmm. Healthcare is expensive, you know? Yeah. I, we are fully aware. So Anthony goes to the library and gets all the history can on uh, Helen in the first movie. Did you guys notice that the librarian here gets like a hero shot? Uh-huh. Like it's a weird, like there's a lot of focus paid on her. And I found out she played Helen Lyle in the scenes that were cut from this movie. Right. Really? Right. She's like flirting with him a little bit too. <laughs> yeah, it's an, it's an odd, it's an odd moment yeah. uh, as it stands in the final cut. Yeah. And he gets in the elevator in this library and there's a piece of candy on the ground and he picks it up. And I found this so funny just in terms of the way it's edited because it's like they show that there's a giant razor in this candy uh-huh. that was clearly not there when it was on the ground in the previous shot. But I'm also like... We're talking like razor stuck in that kid's tongue in Halloween 2 yes. size. Yeah. Well, it's, it is a standard razor size in the size of like half a Jolly Rancher. Like it is... <laughs> and I'm like, y'all, y'all, how do you not see that? Oh, that was the other thing. I was like, we're putting razors in hard candy, hard not can- in like... How the fuck does that work? I can get it in a lab. Taffy Taffy or something. Like you gonna how 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 do you stab a Werther's original? <laughs> <laughs> how do you get it in there and then also back in the wrapper? Like Jesus. <laughs> also, if I get in an elevator and it's fucking made of mirrors, uh-huh. I'm taking the fucking stairs. Yes, yeah. getting off immediately. Fuck that. Yeah, I don't like elevators anyway. No, not a huge fan of all glass elevators. That's just. <laughs> Have you seen Devil? Yeah. It's not a good idea to have glass in your elevator. Have you seen the ending of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Absolutely. So the next note I have is about the art critic's death. Did any of you guys have anything else before that? I just like this idea that he's kind of getting high on his own growing mythology. Yep. Like th- he he's he's sort of stoked about it because now people are interested in him and he's more willing to challenge their notions of what he's talking about. Yeah. yeah. I'm also a fan of this shot of him walking to the art critic's apartment. Yeah. Where we hear, we hear screaming. We hear, like, it's like, this is not as nice as the place where he currently lives, yep. which is really interesting to me. Yep. Man, that's just Chicago. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I also think it looks like the back rooms, you know? Oh my God. Those, yeah. The, the winding apartments. Yeah. Pasta videos. Yeah. 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 I don't know. So th- somehow this movie makes like places that are supposed to feel clean and pristine terrifying mm-hmm. or unsettling. Yeah. 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 And I do love because this scene has one of the best parts of social comedy commentary you could have in this movie oh yeah where he's talking to the art critic who now is suddenly interested in it um now that his name is getting recognition right and he mentions the history of um the sweet guy (laughs) and says why don't you say it say his name yeah which again if you remember if you can throw your mind back to 2020 and 2021 Uh that was the slogan of the summer after george floyd and all the other unfortunate hashtags as they become known right is say his name well there was a there was a a thing that i saw at one point uh, in 2020 because i was both inside terrified of covid and could not stop scrolling on my phone constantly like just refreshing twitter and being like what new atrocity what is happening where where are my how are my friends doing in seattle because they were in like that you know cordoned off zone like where they were being treated like terrorists for you know thinking it's not cool to kill unarmed people yeah and i i just remember i i remember one of my friends saying something along the lines of the most frustrating 
interesting thing is we're doing all of this and people keep using phrases like, quote, everything that's going on right now. Yeah. You know, <laughs> instead of saying like uh, Brianna Taylor was murdered, yeah. you know, like they were just saying like, you know, all that stuff that people are talking about. It's <laughs> it's so infuriating. It is. And that's exactly what he's trying to get through to this critic here. Yeah. And I, I think smartly you know it, it is a commercial commodity but mm-hmm. capitalizing on what is happening right now with all this stuff yeah and putting it into this movie that it fits so perfectly yeah like i don't know i i thought that was brilliant and it's it's one part where we're not we're not talking around any of it which i i love no it's direct yeah y'all, y'all might as well be looking into the camera and saying it like yeah. it's and, and the fact that we don't see the critics say his name yes i think is poignant too but still deals with the ramifications of it absolutely and uh so he he sees sherman in the mirror mimicking every move he's making mm-hmm. he does an improv exercise <laughs> he does do we know the name of the the actor playing sherman here oh i had it pulled up earlier because he doesn't get much credit, but he's really good for not having any lines. Michael Hargrove. Michael Hargrove. Um, he doesn't have any lines. He's not spewing out wisdom like Tony Todd, but he does have a great performance. It's very unsettling. especially Incredibly expressive. Yeah. Especially with like the insinuation that he is uh, not all there in terms of his faculties. There's that moment where he hears when the kid screams and he hears the police officers come into the apartment and you just see him like he looks sad. Like he looks it's pure terror. It's disappointment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, He's great. And he's he's only had he's only worked like a little bit on mostly more of a stage actor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing, too, is in the, the cold open, he offers candy to William. William screams and we cut to seeing the police rush in and we don't see what happens. Right. And then later on we see he screams Sherman, his demeanor changes where he's upset. Yeah. And confused. Yeah. William calms down and then Sherman smiles again and offers him candy again. So like, that's the connection that William makes with him is, oh, this guy's not a scary monster. He's a friend. Right. Which when they show William finding his sister and his sister's friend dead and seeing Sherman, he's not scared. Yeah. Which that stuff all tracks. Mm. It's just, again, I don't fully understand the extent of William's plan at the end. I I get what you said, Mally, and the explanation there. I accept it. I just don't fully agree, I guess. I guess if that's the interpretation, then that's the interpretation. I just don't know if it tracks well for me. Mm. (laughs) But anyways, uh, this art critic's death is incredible. It's probably my... Probably my favorite. I, I said that my favorite shot of the movie was the wide shot. This might be number two, if not equal. Oh, I mean, the shot of the hive, you mean? The hive like, of the, the apartment building? Yeah. Yeah, I love it. And and just the so far away zoom out and her being thrown around like a rag doll and dragged across this window, leaving a blood trail, mm-hmm. you know, just rem- reminiscent of Anthony's painting earlier. And it's very interesting to me that she, before she even hits the floor, we hear a siren. Yeah. Like, it's almost like we, we will all always be there to help you at least yeah immediately a white woman got hurt we got to rush to the scene yes yeah, absolutely and then we cut back and troy is is talking with brianna mm-hmm. about oh anthony said uh the guy's name in the mirror five times and he's like who would be stupid enough to do that <sighs> cut to the high school girl scene yeah <laughs> so this is definitely a studio note yeah. like i i i cannot be convinced this was initially in the original script because it just feels so disjointed and i could not get over the fact that one of the people in this scene is named boof, boof. <laughs> who the fuck <laughs> named their daughter boof <laughs> We got Boof and Jerrica in one movie, y'all. <laughs> what is happening? I would argue Boof is worse. <laughs> Where's that spinoff? <laughs> Boof and Jerrica coming in ABCs. <laughs> From the writers of Happen Leonard, Boof and Jerrica. <laughs> Worst sitcom ever. Worse than the namings in this scene is the fact that everyone is touching everything yeah the the main high school girl kisses the bathroom mirror the other one is on her hands and knees on the floor yeah i'm like stop touching this get off the fucking floor (laughs) it was a pre-covid world it's the worst part of like it's the most disgusting part of this movie and i see a man get his hand cut off later i would not (laughs) touch anything in a bathroom no when i was in high school like going to a high school bathroom you i'm kicking the door down i'm I'm hovering over the toilet when I shit. <laughs> Nathan would only get touched in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, oh my god. That's why I wear the sign. Jesus. I held it. I would like, I don't care. 
I don't care if I'm getting sepsis. I am holding it until I get home. There's no fucking way. No, I'm, I'm in my own bathroom in my own house, and I still don't want to touch the floor or the mirror. Like, I don't absolutely know. not. Wait, you won't? Do you not use public restrooms ever? N- I if I can avoid it, like the plague, I will. If, I really try not to. If I absolutely have to, I'm already shedding a tear. I do not want to use a public restroom. Man, I have a tiny bladder. I I can't do that. I force it. I'm like, nope. Hold that. I'd rather I'd rather piss my pants on this bus than <laughs> use a fucking Starbucks bathroom in los angeles no fucking thing <laughs> if i drink one beer i have to pee three times <laughs> that's me too and i will just i mean w- when i go out if i have to go to a urinal it's not so bad if i have to g- go number two i am not yeah. i will hold it i will get cramps i will limp to the bathroom <laughs> oh okay well that's understandable yeah that's understandable in my band days i would literally stock up on diapers an- <laughs> this is so fucking gross <laughs> i would stock up on anti-diarrhea medicine just to like stop myself up yeah. for like the tour yeah like, <laughs> which is probably why I am deathly ill. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I just, I can't, I can't do it. All that poo had to go somewhere. <laughs> I'm so excited for this to be one of the fucking selects. Like, this is going to be. <laughs> definitely a select. It's definitely a select. I'm going to start calling Nathan sweet poo. <laughs> I don't like that at all. <laughs> I will definitely shit my pants before I put my bare lips on a public bathroom mirror. No fucking way. Not happening. How did you know that I call you bare lips? <laughs> <laughs> because of that one sweet night we had together so that's why <laughs> uh, i want to watch the sitcom that sweet poo and bear lips <laughs> <laughs> You know what? Is it too late to change our band name? No, nobody listened to the first one. <laughs> no, absolutely not. I listen to it on accident sometimes. Accident. Oh, yay. Okay. I'll take it. Because it's like the only thing saved on my phone. Oh. <laughs> like music wise. So when I get in the car, it just starts auto playing. No pictures of his wife. Apple, well, no, like on like Apple Music. Uh huh. It's the only thing I have like saved. Oh, bless. And so it just auto plays when I get in the car. And every time I'm like, what the fuck is the. Oh. <laughs> I, I did that for the longest time time like having music on my phone and uh-huh. then when you get in the car it automatically plays the first song in your library yeah, yeah. And i'm like i gotta change this i'm tired of hearing this song play over and over again i can't oh i've heard the intro to your fucking album so many goddamn times i was actually kind of sad when i stopped saving music to my phone because for the longest time it was ao by lady gaga so every time i would get in the car i'd just hear her go here we go <laughs> just kind of perfect and that's just how nathan like nathan was like that here we do here go. we do yeah. <laughs> indeed we go yes gaga i do i do like the little compact mirror reveal of these deaths i think it's pretty clever that's really good again all the mirror work in this film is excellent excellent i actually really love the moment where the girl opens the compact and she just sees something behind her yeah. and we don't see what she sees i think that's really well done it's, it's it is really good i like the blood waterfall that pours out a boof like, sure <laughs> I thought that was pretty great. Sure. We love a blood waterfall. Boof, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on. That deserves it. <laughs> I feel like it should also get a boo at the same time, though. Sure. It just feels right. But they're not saying boo, they're saying boof. Boof. <laughs> boof. boof. We're slap happy and we have to record another episode after this. <laughs> I know, I know. This is why we shouldn't do these early in the day. <laughs> <laughs> I do like seeing Sherman float in mm-hmm. just out of frame in this compact mirror. I think that's great. It, it almost makes up for this scene being completely unnecessary. It's superfluous. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And so Anthony at this point is just, his body is destroyed. He is, he's almost like he's becoming the fly. Moisturized, dude, one time. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, he goes to the hospital finally. Right. And the, the nurse that's seeing him says, welcome back. And he says, uh, what do you mean? This is my first time here. And she goes, no, you were born here. I'm looking right at your, your records. And Anthony has always believed that he was born on the South side. Well, uh-huh. it turns out he was born in Cabrini Green. Right. So this whole movie, Brianna keeps talking about, oh, you, you have to go see your mom. Your mom keeps calling. We keep seeing mom on this phone. Yeah. And we finally go. And I, I got to say, uh-huh. as someone who did not see the original movie before seeing this one, uh-huh. the reveal of who Anthony was didn't affect me at all. Sure. <laughs> yeah. No fucking shit. Dustin, <laughs> well, that's like watching Blade Runner 2049 and not understanding why seeing Harrison Ford was a big deal. No, I disagree because in this movie, the, the way it starts what? with the way it starts <laughs> is with Troy explaining the story of the baby and everything. Mm. And if Anthony is going to the library to do research on Helen, he would have, I'm sure Anthony's name and his mother's name would have been in those papers because yeah. why wouldn't they be? She's Helen theoretically stole Vanessa Williams' baby. Fizzy lifting drinks. (laughs) 
<laughs> God damn it. Uh, not necessarily. Why not? If he's doing all this research, she definitely would have been in the paper. Not necessarily. Why? Her baby was stolen. Because I Because <laughs> you want to be a contrarian. That's why. Well, no, like- <laughs> doubt the cops did that much fucking research i mean isn't it isn't it true though like sometimes when a when like a child is abducted they don't necessarily the mom's name would have been yeah probably yeah you assume the mom cooperated with the police what Plus, the, the Helen murdered her dog. Like, I feel like her name would have been mentioned at some point right. in this story. But I, anyway, either way, if you're watching this movie having seen the original and you see that this lead character's name is Anthony. Right. I feel like that's it, it's got to be like an obvious reveal then. Right. I so I I wish. Hmm. See, I don't know. I don't think it's I don't. Is it supposed to be like a massive reveal? Because like I'm pretty sure it is. I went into this movie like just assuming he was the baby. Yeah, that's how I would feel about it, too. But the movie plays it like it's a reveal. I do wish maybe that Vanessa Williams hadn't been in the trailer yes. because that's such a I love I love the reveal of her uh, on the other side of the door. But yeah, I, I went into the movie basically being like, oh, well, he's the baby, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. That's why I find it weird that they make it a reveal. Oh, Vanessa Williams is the mom like i don't know yeah they do build up the mom for a while before they they show her yeah and as much as i like vanessa williams in this movie she's immediately checked out after this one scene and i'm like no keep her in she's great oh i don't know i do love that she has the scar on her arm yes and i think she's unbelievable in this scene yes dude again that shot in the like that little bit in the trailer when "Mm, she shushes him don't don't say that yes oh it's very good that's probably my favorite moment of the whole fucking movie honestly (laughs) it's really good you could see the fear in her eyes and and his reaction when she when she kind of like exhales and says when you first got taken and he just the the betrayal the yeah. like everything just hits him all at once you see him crumple and it's uh this whole scene is so great it's great and then the way it ends with the reflection of them two in the mirror as he leaves the apartment yeah. like mm-hmm. it's this is like the most well-crafted scene in the movie it's A brilliant performance by Vanessa Williams. Mm -hmm. She has to keep restarting the story because Anthony is like flustered and like keeps interrupting her and everything. So he finds out that he's the baby that was taken by uh, the 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 boogeyman in the first movie. Sweet dude, the sweet guy, sugar lips. (laughs) And so he he leaves, and this is where the movie kind of becomes. This is where the movie kind of becomes a Brianna story because she confronted Anthony earlier, and he's like, "No, he's real." And she's like, "Look, he's not real. I'll prove it to you." And she starts to say his name in the mirror. He lashes out and breaks a bunch of the reflective surfaces in the room. And then they she immediately is like, nope, this guy is crazy. I can't fucking do this. I'm out. She's so good in this scene. And I, you know, it's a funny thing I think about anytime I, I, I think about when people have read a full script, you know, and they're like, well, I know what the story is. And yeah. they still have to play the reality of being so baffled by someone else's behavior. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think there, th- it doesn't even feel like acting in this scene. Like she seems so overwhelmed by his behavior and and the way he's reacting to her i i just man it i i feel so bad for her in this scene she is like the most realistic portrayal of a character in a horror movie i've seen in a long time like Uh, yeah as a significant other that is actually like significant yeah she's the polar opposite of clive yes Yes. (laughs) she's the she she reads a room perfectly as soon as anthony starts lashing out she's like nope not dealing with this i'm getting the fuck out of here oh when when you see her when you see his art and she's like what the fuck are these yeah i kind of want to be like girl this is the best work he's done yes Yes. for real (laughs) absolutely 100%. Absolutely. 100%. When, when she's in the laundromat later on and she sees the stairs to the basement and she just goes, nope. Like, I I'm love like, that. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So good. It's It reminds me of... Uh the first insidious where the like i think that's why i fell in love with that movie's like the moment spooky shit happens they're just like yeah we're moving get the fuck out <laughs> rose Byrne says get let's get out of this fucking house yeah. it's so good yeah i legit i saw that movie in theaters and i literally cheered i was like I yes clapped. yeah fucking that someone finally oh, that's so good so we kind of didn't really explain it set it up very well but anthony runs into coleman domingo who is in cabrini green and kind of explains the whole history of the city and or the area and the legend of uh sweet lips <laughs> and <laughs> which we're kickstarting at the end of this season right like the legend <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm uh, he mentions to Brianna earlier on, and so when he goes, Anthony goes missing, uh, she decides to go to the laundromat and find uh, William Burke, Coleman Domingo's character. Mm-hmm. He 
kidnaps her, right. brings her to this dilapidated church where Anthony is there, who is, again, just... The, the bee sting has evolved to full-grown leprosy. Like, oh, it is... He his, <laughs> essentially has, like, a, a, a honeycomb pattern yeah. decaying into his skin. Yeah. And it's some of the most effective horror makeup I've ever seen, yeah. I think. Like, it genuinely upsets me. They crush it with that. Yeah. I have a question, though. Yeah. Did, did Willie, like... This this man just had a Candyman jacket on standby. Like, I, <laughs> I guess he does. He does own a dry cleaning business. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, huh? And I guess, I guess he also has an underground tunnel that leads from this laundromat to this church. Because sure. I don't know how he gets through there otherwise. But have you never heard about the Chicago catacombs? I have not, and I, I am I- eager to learn. <laughs> Is this true? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it's called the L. It's the subway, idiots. <laughs> I was gonna say no. It's not true. <laughs> Nathan, for a second, was like, "Yo, wait, hold on, what?" <laughs> <laughs> Anthony is in a trance and you know Brianna's tied up and William has the greatest line because like she he says to her when she wakes up she goes what is this and he goes I was baptized here yeah yeah I guess I'm on some other shit now huh oh yeah. my god <laughs> he he somehow manages to both chew the scenery uh-huh. and give a believable performance at the same time it's he's one brilliant. of it, it he's manic but he's also so focused and uh, and meanwhile yaya is like getting his hands sawed off oh. and he's just like silently groaning and crying yeah without changing his expression it it's it, this whole scene is so great to me i like the idea of the scene but william burke's character just completely becoming unhinged and unwound sure. in the 11th hour just felt like wait a minute there's a scene missing here because i don't understand well to me it's it's like every scream movie as soon as the mask comes off yep. the character becomes jim carrey and the mask uh-huh. like. they become a caricature of themselves yeah. yeah absolutely everyone's trying to outdo matthew lillard from the first one uh-huh so he kind of just gives his whole spiel, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But his his plan is I'm going to make Anthony a new one of these uh these guys mm-hmm. to terrorize people. And she manages to escape her bindings. William kind of chases her through the tunnel. Singing to her. Yeah. Which is like I, I'm like in the real like you're right though like it, it is weird that he goes from a chill laundromat owner to now I'm gonna do a voice while yeah. I sing uh huh uh-huh. he becomes a typical horror movie villain like out of, out of nowhere but it's so cool it is he, <laughs> if anyone else was doing it it wouldn't be as cool I agree. absolutely it's it's the gift that Coleman Domingo has as an actor he can be convincing we just heard me like not do it well yeah. <laughs> exactly he, he he is convincing even when it doesn't make sense like it that's how good an actor he is right and it's almost kind of anticlimactic here because i thought this would be the ending of the movie even if it is so fast uh-huh. but like brianna kills him pretty quickly like there's not really a big thing stabs the shit out of him i kind of like that he dies quick i, I do, do too, too. She, she he's just an old he's just an old dude who owns a laundromat i do like it that there's not like some superpower that he's not like a like he can take a bunch of beating but she stabs him with his pen until he's fucking mince meat i am also a sweet lips <laughs> i do love that we also don't watch her stab like we don't see the other stabs connect yeah. we get the one in the neck and then she stabs the shit out of him like 15 times but we're not we're just focusing on her face when she does it yeah Yeah, absolutely and like i said this is how smart of a character this is she does not stop until that dude's face is kaput (laughs) right somebody should have taught this to anyone in a halloween movie like make them ground beef basically (laughs) but then anthony comes in he kind of collapses in her arms and this is where i thought the movie just became really disjointed because then the police burst in Mm. and i'm like no this is the end of the movie right here we don't we don't really need this last bit here but the police burst in they shoot Anthony dead, uh-huh. even though he's in Brianna's lap and she doesn't take any damage. No, I was about to say credit where credit's due. <laughs> that cop has fantastic aim. Yeah. Maybe just to shoot him without hurting her at all. It's incredible. But this is when uh, you know they they shoot Anthony dead. They put her in the back of a police car, and then you can almost see the scene coming from a mile away. But oh yeah, I mean, as soon as this cop starts talking, I'm like, oh this this dude's dead, and I cannot wait for it to happen. Yeah. It can't come soon enough. He tries to basically coach her and. To saying like, oh, well, he was, you know, attacking the officer. So yeah. we had to put him down. He was a big, scary guy. We right. had to put him down. And yeah. Mally, this is your pick. Why don't you kind of recap what happens here at the end? Um, The cop drives her home and she gets a good night's rest. It's it's surprising <laughs> we picked this movie to do on the show because it ends so nicely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, no, she throws up the bat signal, so to say. <laughs> 
Uh-huh. Yeah, she she says Candyman four times, mm-hmm. uh, and then the racist cop says it one more time, and then one of his buddies just comes out bleeding. Instantly. I love that shot. It was so quick. I love it. <laughs> and then we get this cool little wonder of uh, Anthony as Candyman just fucking murdering police officers, mm-hmm. and it's fucking awesome. Yeah, it's great. I, I will never get tired of seeing racist police officers getting <laughs> mowed down. Yeah. I lo- like, it's a short little wonder but i do like that little wonder yeah, from like kind of her pov from inside the car yeah it's really neat I, I also love this bit of seeing the reflections of previous candy man yeah that, like that we haven't even some of whom we haven't even talked about yes this has just been going on forever i i also enjoy the fact that she is like not making eye contact with any of the horror that's happening around uh-huh. her she is like i'm not fucking looking mm-hmm. <laughs> And then, yeah, he kind of just gives like this, the same speech that Tony Todd gave in the original, Uh, you know, I am the writing on the wall. That's so good. Yeah. I do like uh, when he's just bees for a head yes. is also a pretty good effect, yeah. too. Like, the face isn't there. It's just bees. Ye old bee head. <laughs> he lets her out of the back of the, of the squad car, and then this last cop manages to get away and runs away. She follows after him, and, and Anthony murders him. Disembowels that bitch Before becoming Tony Todd yeah. right here at the end, which... I feel like it should be illegal to have Tony Todd in this movie this little. Like, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's not fair that he gets two words and then the credits roll. But I think it's such a, it's such a smart use of him, though. I yeah, agree. I just, I wanted more. Yeah, <laughs> no, I get it. He's, I love him. And to DH him was odd. I don't know why. Well, Ghosts I mean, don't get older. Yeah, exactly. I was like, a vengeful spirit doesn't age, man. Yeah, but who cares? <laughs> who cares? Who cares to show Tony Todd as he is? Who cares? <laughs> sure. I mean, if he's there for one shot, why not? I don't know. It doesn't matter. But he says, uh, tell everyone, cut credits. Yeah. Rock and roll, dude. I fucking love it. I love it. It's so rad. It's really good. And then we get some some closing credits of more puppet shows yeah. kind of telling the history of other people that have become this character. I love the credits. Some of whom are based on real people. Based on real people and some of whom are children. Yeah. Which I thought was interesting. But the closing credits are fun. Like, the puppet show stuff is incredible. It's incredibly well done. Well, and I love that the puppet show takes precedence over the credits. Yeah. Yes. Like, the cre- like it's almost like a split screen thing because yeah. it's kind of like mimicking the art show uh-huh. it's like the credits are kind of tiny on the right yeah it's it's really good i loved it yeah that's that's really the end of the movie is there any final thoughts or anything we want to get into before we get into the wrap-up segments Woo! <laughs> <laughs> why don't we uh, go ahead and get into prop cop okay I was like, isn't there usually a theme? I had to get that to it. (laughs) So, uh, if you've never listened to our show, we have a couple of segments here at the end. Uh, We'd just like to have a little bit of fun with a movie we just talked about. In this case, we're going to start with Prop Cop, which is where we look at all the physical, tangible items that are in the movie that we're talking about this week, and we pick one prop, and that term is kind of used a little bit loosely, but one prop from the movie to keep for ourselves. Mally, I will allow you first pick, because this is your movie. What prop do you want? I mean... Since there's apparently just, like, so many of them just lying around, let me snag one of those sweet poo jackets, you know? <laughs> All right. It's a good jacket. It does look like a cozy jacket. Dude, yeah. fucking, this, th- like, these movies walked so that Tom Hardy's Bane could run. <laughs> uh-huh. They put Bane on. Absolutely. Nathan, what's your prop? So, I, I do agree that the bathroom scene is a little superfluous, but- Trina has a backpack with uh, bad brains and Black Lives Matter patches on it yeah. that I, would, I think I would rock. Okay. Sure, absolutely. I love shit that carries other shit. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Containers? Are you kidding me? Oh, my God. <laughs> I am going to cut the prop of the two little lollipops that William Perk holds up during his rant, yeah. where he's like, don't you want a treat? <laughs> or whatever the fuck he says. He says, yeah, and he says something like, and now the sacrament. Uh-huh. <laughs> One of them looks lemon flavored, though. I'm not about that life. Dude. Yeah. I, I'm going to say, I never thought I would be this person. Well, you're addicted to lemon drops now. <laughs> I was going to say, I've never thought I would say this. I am coming around on lemons, dude. I have been eating so much lemon flavored stuff. <laughs> oh, no. I love lemons. I just don't like lemon flavored things. Mm. It, it depends. It depends on what it is. Same with peach. Ooh, I love yeah. a peach. I don't like peach flavored things. That's how I am with cherry. I like, see, I like all of them. I, I'm coming around on lemon flavored stuff. I don't like cherry. <laughs> Well, let's talk about bit part, fellas, and that is, of course, where we look at all of the smaller roles in the movie, the extras, preferably no-name characters, and we recast them just for us to have a little bit part in the movie. I'm going to say I want to be... 
I want to be one of the cops at the end of the movie, but for one reason and one reason alone, because there's one of them that decides when all his buddies are being murdered that he's going to bang on the window of the person in the backseat of the police SUV to yes. try and get help and not yeah. the police officer sitting in the front seat that can help him. Right. So I want to be that dumbass guy. <laughs> Um, Manly, what about you? Well, it's funny you picked that because I, I literally wrote down, I feel like we have to be like <laughs> some of the random racist cops at the end. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to, I'm actually just going to go, just throw me somewhere in the art show. Okay. Sure. Drinking a blue moon. <laughs> Dude, I go to, I go to art shows all the time. They're the most like awkward social experiences ever. <laughs> they yeah. seem like it. They really are. Like art's cool, but Jesus, art shows are weird. Yeah, I, I believe it. So just fucking throw me in there somewhere. <laughs> Neither one about you. <laughs> Uh, I want to be the girl who says not today and leaves the bathroom yes. before they finish the chant. <laughs> the the one non-white girl in yeah. that scene. She's an Asian girl that's like, nope, not dealing with this shit. I love it. That's brilliant. I love it. I mean, Nathan basically is an Asian girl. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to ask in what way, but I'm afraid to. So why don't we go ahead and get into the silver lining? <laughs> he went for the backpack. <laughs> Okay, I will go and say Anthony got the fame he was looking for. Ooh. Mm. So, there you go. Not bad. He 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 clearly wanted fame. He got it. And if anyone's going to become one of these uh, sweet men, you know, Anthony seems to be the most, uh, like we talked about, like the one that offers the most like ret- retribution instead of just being full on, uh, full of hate yeah. and uh, resentment, you know? So, there you go. Who else wants to go? Uh, Sugar Dude had his power returned to him, and he means something new to the community now. All right. I get that. I'm down with that one. Mally? Um, the, I mean, the Sweet Dudes as a group, I think this is great. Um, they're really helping sustain the bee population. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and, I mean, that's just fantastic. Bees are endangered. That's, so right. that's what I'm saying, you know. Yeah. They out here. Can I tell you guys uh, my other one that I wrote down here that I was unsure about whether I should pick or not? Sure. I said, now Jerrica doesn't even have to worry about that Nuva ring. <laughs> so, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> True. True. <laughs> I was channeling my inner you, Mally, to come up with that separate lighting. So. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. You're welcome. At the end of every movie, we cover on this show if you're a returning listener you know we do this we always like to give you an alternative movie for the movie of the week something you watch as a double feature so that way things aren't so dour by the end of it Mm -hmm. and this episode is no exception fellas what is a movie people should pair uh with this 2020 requel uh if anyone b movie (laughs) nope I said, if anyone picks the B movie, I was going to fucking lose it. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> I knew it was coming. Son of a uh, bitch. I got an alternate. I got an alternate. <laughs> <laughs> What's your alternate, Nathan? Uh, there's another movie about a, a, a wicked uh, candy man, Wreck-It Ralph. <laughs> okay. All right. I like that one. Uh, Mally, what about you? 1992's B. Thoven. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm just, we all should have picked B movies. Be kind, rewind. We all should have picked. God damn it! Oh my god! <laughs> Life is beautiful. <laughs> I wrote Strangers with Candy. Uh, no, I didn't. I wrote down, if you want more Yaya, yeah, yeah. doing something totally different, but having a lot of fun, and it is a movie I have recommended on this show plenty of times before. Mm. Ambulalance. Yes, you should. You should see Ambulance. <laughs> I'm really shocked no one pick Nicolas Cage in The Wicker Man. I, well, I'd have to rewatch that. I try not to recommend movies we've done on the show as pick me ups, but I, I hear about you. It. I, I see the connection. Well, and also, no one, no one went with another movie that revolves around someone saying someone's name a few times, B told Juice. I, you know what? I, I did want to open that Pandora's box. <sighs> of, uh, there's too many names we can't say already. I don't want to add him into the mix. So, But I hear you. Beetlejuice. Oh, God damn it. That's two now. We got to play it very careful here, fellas. It's getting too close. I can't handle Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I like, keep remembering it and laughing. That's one of my shining moments on this show, guys. <laughs> Between that and Field of Dreams, I'm crushing it on Pick Me Up. You really are. See, I thought you were going to say some something about Mary was probably your beacon for me. <laughs> that was oh, good. I forgot about that. Uh huh. That was a perfect, perfect one. <laughs> what is the best kill of the movie, fellas? Oh, for me, it's got to be the art critic. Yeah, I think that one's pretty great. Yeah. yeah. I, I am a big fan of the cop just sort of stumbling out of the uh, building, holding his throat, though. I yeah. think that was so good. <laughs> I do like that one a lot. That is great. That's great. And lastly, do we recommend this movie? Hell yeah. yeah. I, I would say it. 
I think you need to watch the original. I don't, I think if yeah, there's... Yeah, don't, don't dust in this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think it stands on its own, but in, in, a, in a lot of ways, that's kind of emblematic of urban legends, right? Like, they exist in the retelling. Like, that's where they thrive. Yeah. So, I, I think, do a double feature of this oh. one and, and the original together. Okay. I have another pick-me-up, and it's fucking urban legend. Oh, yeah. Great choice. So fun. Yeah. That makes sense. I also recommend this movie. I think it's a decent companion to the original. Mm -hmm. Especially when you watch them in the correct order, you (laughs) fucking idiot. There you go. I also feel like it's a bit aggressive in how hard it's trying to be social commentary. It's trying really hard to balance that aspect of it while also being a modern horror movie. And I think that's tough. Sure. Especially when you're doing a a sequel to a beloved movie. Like I've I've said plenty of times in this episode, I just think it's a little muddled. I think it would have benefited from another script rewrite, another draft of it. Mm -hmm. But that being said, I know I've voiced my complaints about this movie plenty on this episode. There is a lot of good in here. I think the production design is incredible. The cinematography is great. Everything is firing on all cylinders for me, except for the plot, for the most part. Mm. And the special effects, we didn't really talk about too much, but the, the special effects work is great. Oh, they're fantastic. Yeah. Oh, there's also one thing we didn't talk about. Apparently, they only say Anthony's full name uh-huh. five times. Yep, oh, sure wow. Do. I love that. I love that. And on the fifth time, on the fifth time is when he, he loses himself. So, yeah. That was pretty, pretty brilliant. But yeah, I do th- I do think this is a, a, a rad movie. Mm-hmm. It's not one I would revisit often, but I think it's stellar work from Nia DaCosta, for sure. Sweet. I've watched this like five times Damn. since I came. Oh my God. Uh-oh. That's not good. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> well, listener, thank you for listening to our review of this movie. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening to us at. Uh, leave us a rating and some feedback. We'd really appreciate that. You can also voice your opinions on this movie, whether we got stuff right or if you want to tell me how fucking wrong I am, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> much like Mally has been doing by emailing us at the silver linings playlist at gmail.com uh, if you haven't already you can also follow us on Twitter Instagram and TikTok as well as our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash silver linings playlist mm-hmm. now fellas unfortunately speaking of five times we've had five spooky linings this year this season and we're, we're coming to an end this is it spooky linings is over I'll miss you however we're not getting off the horror train just yet Choo choo. because next week Nathan is your pick that's right we are starting november off with some spooky bits too so why don't you give us a clue for what we're talking about on our next episode just judging from the opening scene i think this might be mally's favorite sequel of all time oh okay (laughs) i am boy is not bad (laughs) i also i I have an alternate clue oh please we commit next week's movie to the void happily (laughs) (laughs) oh boy it's gonna be an interesting conversation i have a feeling but yeah Spooky Linens, we're closing up shop. Keep staying tuned to this feed, though. We've still got plenty more coming this season. Uh, oh, wait. My my wife would wife. like to interject with one note about Candyman. Okay. okay. Call your mom. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Call, call your mom. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, rest in peace, Oatmeal. And uh, I guess Anthony. Yeah. And Sherman. Daniel Robitaille. Uh-huh. And as always, Moscato is a dessert wine. Nobody cares about my bangs. <laughs> Beetlejuice. (laughs) Excelsior. 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 Look it up. And uh, everyone else that's become Candyman. Oh, fuck. I think that was five times. Fuck. Ah! Ah! Eat shit, Dustin. (laughs) Jesus Christ, that was a long one. Uh, anyway, if you're still here, thanks for listening. And remember, you can always check out our back catalog for over 100 episodes of the show. Like, subscribe, and leave feedback if you want. And tune in next week for another one. Laters!